Republicans generally argued that the US is not the largest polluter and thus, eliminating pollution within the US isn't as effective as it may seem. Conversely, Democrats argued that the US is nonetheless a top polluter and thus, we should set the example by reducing pollution first. So, which country is actually putting out the most pollution today and can we ever become a 100% eco-friendly society? Well, starting off, if we take a look at the CO2 emission charts, we will immediately see that the largest polluter in terms of CO2 is in fact China by far, as they put out 10.06 gigatons of pollution every single year. That accounts for 28% of global CO2 air pollution and is the same as 10.06 quadrillion grams of pollution. We all know that's an insanely large number. But when we're dealing with such unfathomable numbers, we usually don't understand how big the number truly is. So let's translate that giant into more comprehensible numbers. If each gram of pollution was equal to a dollar, China's pollution would be enough to give every single person in the entire world $1.25 million every year. And even if you put out one gram of CO2 every single second of your entire life, it would take you 317 million years to reach China's annual CO2 emissions. So yeah, it's a big number. And though the US is far behind China, we're not necessarily good either. The United States puts out 5.41 gigatons of CO2 every year, which accounts for about 15% of global CO2 emissions. If you take a closer look at this chart, you'll quickly see that the top 4 global polluters which are China, the US, India, and Russia account for over half of global CO2 emissions at 55%. But this doesn't paint the clearest of pictures as each of these countries have vastly different population sizes. So if we transition to CO2 emissions per capita, we'll see that the top polluter is the oil giant Saudi Arabia who comes in at 18.48 tons of CO2 per person. However, with this statistic, the margins aren't nearly as large and Kazakhstan, Australia, the US, and Canada come in at nearly the same amount. Something to note though is that China falls down to 13th place in this measure and India falls down to 21st place. But even this is not the best way to rank CO2 emissions by country because each of these countries radically vary in terms of consumption. Sure, China and Saudi Arabia come out on top in terms of CO2 emissions. However, the products that these countries produce are consumed on a worldwide basis. 40% of all worldwide consumer electronics come from not China in total, but more surprisingly, one company in China, which is Foxconn. All of your Apple, Dell, Amazon, HP products, and basically half of every other electronic company you can think of get some of their components or their entire products from this one company in China. And this is perfectly illustrated by these countries' net export figures. China's net exports are positive $426 billion per year, meaning that they produce $426 billion more than they consume. The US on the other hand not only has negative net exports, but the most negative net exports in the entire world by far. We stood at negative $776 billion in net exports in 2017. Second place goes to the UK and they're only about a fifth of the US at negative $166 billion. Now, this is not too bad from an economical standpoint as the US economy is the largest in the world. So our net exports in relation to our GDP is really not that bad. But this is extraordinarily terrible when it comes to carbon footprint as we are the largest net consumers and a significant proportion of China's crazy high CO2 emissions can be attributed to us as well as other western power consumers. As a result, if we account for these consumption discrepancies, the largest air polluter in the world is likely the US and other western countries such as Canada, the UK, and France are likely not that far behind on a per capita basis. Meanwhile, the pollution from China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia isn't nearly as bad as they seem 
as a significant amount of their pollution can actually be attributed to Western countries. With that being said, where is all of this air pollution even coming from? And is it possible to fix? Is it manufacturing or planes or cars or something else? Well, the answer is actually electricity and heat production, which accounts for 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And this is closely followed up by agriculture, forestry, and other land use, which comes in at 24%. Industry accounts for 21%, and transportation actually only accounts for 14%. Now, everything we covered so far sounds really bad. And politicians often like to bring up these points in doomsday talks to try to win over votes. Don't get me wrong here, air pollution is a very serious concern. But what often gets overlooked is all of the outstanding progress we have already made. Since the year 1980, our aggregate emissions, according to EPA, has decreased by 71%. In other words, we only put out 29% of the air pollution that we put out in 1980. This is despite a 182% increase in gross domestic product, a 114% increase in vehicle miles traveled, a 44% increase in population, and a 28% increase in energy consumption. It's frightening to think how much we were polluting the air in the 1980s if today it is already quite bad. On the bright side, over the last 40 years, our economy has nearly tripled, and we have become power consumers of energy and manufactured goods. But despite this, our aggregate emissions has nearly quartered. And this is all thanks to innovations in reducing air pollution across the board. With such great progress, can we become a 100% eco-friendly society? Well, unfortunately, the answer is no. But we can get well into the 90% range. This isn't to say that we can't eliminate virtually all air pollution on the earth. However, it's unlikely that we'll get to 0% air pollution on a societal level. This is because certain processes cannot be transitioned into 100% eco-friendly. If we take a look at each of the top polluting economic sectors, we'll see that there are portions of each industry that can't be completely transitioned. For example, as for electricity and heat production, we can create clean energy using solar panels, wind turbines, and hydropower. But at the end of the day, no matter the path we choose, we'll have to store the energy in battery cells. And of course, battery cell production causes pollution. Not to mention, we have to actually manufacture the wind turbines, the solar panels, the motors, and so on and so forth. And this is the same case with transportation as well. The production of vehicles themselves, as well as the batteries, will continue contributing to air pollution. As for agriculture, the general trend towards organic food could actually increase our overall emissions by 21%. But that's not accounting for any improvements in agriculture efficiency, which we have consistently seen over the past several decades. And finally, moving on to the last major sector, we have industry. Interestingly, the vast majority of emissions from this sector are actually from creating energy to run these facilities as opposed to the processes that are actually taking place within these facilities. Thus, most of this sector can eventually be converted to running on electric as well. But this again proposes pollution from battery cell production. Anyways, as you can see, though we are able to eliminate the vast majority of global emissions by transitioning into clean energy and increasing efficiency, there will be certain aspects that will linger on, unless we figure out how to eliminate batteries themselves or something like that. If this is the case, how would it be possible to eliminate virtually all air pollution on Earth? Well, the answer may lie in Jeff Bezos' plan to move heavy industries like battery production and energy collection to other planets. But even if that doesn't come to fruition, we should be able to get 90% plus eco-friendly. The question though is how long this will take. If we annualize the 71% reduction in emissions over the last 40 years, we get an annual decline of approximately negative 3.05% per year. This number should only accelerate as we move forward, thanks to the exponential breakthroughs we are making regarding battery technology, which will significantly aid in the transition to clean energy. If we assume that the year 1980 was 100% non-eco-friendly, which it was not, and give ourselves a 3% improvement rate per year, we should reach 90% eco-friendly in 35 years, or about 2055. But of course, 
1980 was not 100% non-eco-friendly, so a more reasonable estimate would likely be in the 2040s, especially with exponential battery advancements. So basically, by 2050. At that same rate, we would reach 95% eco-friendly in the late 2070s and 97.5% eco-friendly by the end of the century. And we can work on getting to 100% by potentially shifting certain industries off of the earth in the 2100s. So that would be the natural progression towards a 100% eco-friendly society. And that's not too bad at all. But many liberal politicians want to accelerate this curve from 30 to 40 years to just 10 to 20 years, which may be possible given government mandates and strict regulation. So the question isn't whether we'll reach a solid 90% plus eco-friendly society, as this will happen with or without government aid simply due to innovation. The real question is whether it's worth rapidly displacing tens of millions of jobs and hundreds of businesses in favor of pushing forward this timeline by 10 to 20 years. Do you guys think the environmental benefits of moving forward the timeline by 10 to 20 years is worth the economic sacrifice? Comment that down below. Also, if you guys appreciate the depth of this analysis, then make sure to drop a like and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.